Summary of Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey Desert Solitaire is a story by Edward Abbey about a summer he worked as a park ranger in Arches National Monument near Moab, Utah, in 1956. This was ten years before he wrote the book. Abbey's favorite park is being changed so much by the U.S. government that he can't even recognize it anymore. He is now writing about his time in the park to show how beautiful it is and to criticize the National Park Service for not doing enough to protect it. Abby takes a long trip from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to Moab, Utah, in the summer of 1956. Abby notices the wildlife around his caravan in Arches National Monument, where he will live and work for the summer. He accepts that he will have to share his room with the animals who live there. The next morning, after seeing his first beautiful sunrise, Abby starts to wonder if what he sees is what is real. He promises not to talk about nature in human terms, so that he can get closer to it and understand its secrets better. Soon, Merle McRae, who runs the park, and Floyd Bentz, who is in charge of the rangers, will bring supplies to Abby. After eating together, the men go their separate ways, and Abby realizes how alone he feels in his job as a park guard. But soon he finds out how many animals live near his caravan. He even tames a gopher snake and makes it his pet. Abby can't help but give the animals personalities as he talks about the different kinds of animals that live nearby and is amazed by their beauty and complexity. He also looks at plants. By May, he was very interested in a 300-year-old juniper tree near him that seemed to be connected to another world. Abby starts his job as a park ranger by making his rounds to different sites. He is amazed by the huge rock arches and saddened by how carelessly people tend to treat the environment. Abby soon feels like he could live here forever, but one day, some government engineers stop by his trailer and tell him about the huge highway they are planning to build into arches. Abby realizes that the desert will no longer be as lonely and unusual as he has grown to love. He then jumps ahead to 1967 and talks about how this highway was built and how Arches and many other parks are now full of tourists and businesses. Abby hates this new trend, which he calls industrial tourism. Developers say that roads make parks easier to get to, while preservers say that pavement takes away from nature. This is mostly because of the 1964 Wilderness Preservation Act. Abby is on the side of the preservers because parking spots and paved roads take away from the point of nature, which is to get people away from technology and give them a break from their everyday lives. Abby lists a few things that could be done to stop industrial tourism. For example, parking lots could be moved to the edges of parks, all new paved roads and parks could be stopped, and more park guards could be put out in the field to help with the increase in foot traffic. Uranium deposits in Moab cause a different kind of greed. After the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, the Atomic Energy Commission urged a mad rush for uranium in Utah and Colorado. Many amateur prospectors died or went to their graves trying to get rich. Alfred T. Husk moved his family from Texas to try to find uranium in the canyonlands of Moab. This is a sad story, but it may be made up. Because he was away from home a lot, his wife started seeing his business partner, Charles Graham. This turned out to be fatal when Graham killed Husk out of anger and then killed himself by mistake. Husk's son Billy Joe is thought to be dead after the murder, but he spends a few important days in the wilderness, much like Abby, and bonds emotionally with nature in a way that his greedy father could never do. Abby sometimes works for Roy Scobie, a paranoid local cattle rancher, which makes him think about death. Abby thinks that dying in nature would be a natural way for human energy to return to the environment where it belongs. Scobie can't see this simple truth because of his illogical fears. Abby says that because he is cheap, he doesn't pay his angry assistant Viviano Jacquas enough. This makes Abby sad about how commercial industry, overpopulation, and too much tourists are hurting honest ways of life in the American West. The local Navajo are a great example of this, as their freedom and sense of community have been taken away by both population growth and business. Cowboys like Scobie and Leslie McKee are also hurt by mechanized cattle farming, 
which has made them poor and turned them into Hollywood stereotypes and tourist draws. Abby talks about the different ways water can look in the desert after she talks about politics. He gives people a helpful guide on how to stay hydrated in an emergency. Storms and sudden storms are the most interesting things that happen. Because they are so strange, Abby has to use creative language and, in one case, a poem to explain them. As July goes on, the summer heat gets too much to handle. Abby feels refreshed just by looking at the cold mountains on the distance. This makes him think that all of nature, just by being there, does the same thing for people who live in cities? Nature needs to be protected because it gives people hope and because it would be the right place for a populist uprising against a tyrannical government, which Abby thinks is a real threat in America. Abby hears about Moon Eye, a legendary wild horse that has been lost for 10 years, while she is out on a cattle mission one day. Abby follows him around constantly until he finds him one day. When he does, he and the horse get into a standoff that lasts for hours. Even though he fails to bring Moon Eye home, Abby talks to the skinny horse more than to any other character in the book. He uses human logic, persuasion, and kindness to try to get Moon Eye to come home. By June, Abby and his friend Ralph Newcomb follow the famous path that John Wesley Powell took down the Colorado River through Glen Canyon. This area has since been flooded so much that it is hard to tell where the path was. Abby comes to think that the area is holy as she and her friends explore caves, grottos, cliff walks, shorelines, and the Great Rainbow Bridge. This holy place is gone forever, which is like the Great Chartres Cathedral being covered in mud. Abby's long time with Ralph Newcomb teaches him about the spiritual aspects of nature. It also makes him love people again and he thinks about how feeling free in nature makes people able to love. Abby puts these ideas about solitude to the test on another trip. She spends six weeks alone in Havasupai Canyon, near the Grand Canyon, in perfect harmony with nature. Sometimes she celebrates with Native Americans who live nearby, and once she almost drowns in a rock pool. Abby lives in a dreamy state as Adam from the Bible. He almost forgets that he is different from the trees around him. Back in Arches, in the middle of a terrible summer, Abby is asked to help find a lost tourist. Abby and his search group find the dead photographer at Grandview Point. This makes Abby jealous that the man died naturally in the open, away from hospitals and priests. He thinks that the man's energy is being used again by the buzzards who eat him. Abby goes to nearby Takunavats Mountain to get away from the oppressive heat of August. At the top, it's snowy and beautiful, and he admires the birdsong, the aspen trees, and the faraway scenery, which he jokingly renames from his perch to show how language is both personal and arbitrary. But he comes to believe that, unlike mountains or the sea, the desert is the most interesting environment on Earth. By Labor Day, Abby realizes that the tourists he hates so much are not so bad. Even though they have silly beliefs, the local Mormons are especially worthy because they were some of the first people to build a caring, efficient community in this harsh environment. Abby thinks more about the desert's unique appeal after they reach their goal. The desert is a strange place that is neither friendly like the mountains nor dangerous like the sea. Also, nothing is hidden by the desert's perfect clarity. It is exactly as it seems, driving people crazy as they try to figure out more about it and giving rise to an almost religious fascination that few writers have tried to describe, and mostly failed to do so. Abby hates society, but he admits that what he really hates is people's fake sense of superiority, not the people themselves. He finds out this about himself during an argument with a mysterious tourist named Jay. Prometheus Birdsong, who praises technology and medicine, much to Abby's annoyance. Abby thinks that Earth is so much bigger than people. As he watches the night sky, he thinks about this and about how silly people's religious beliefs are. Abby's last getaway is to the maze, a group of dangerous mountains where he goes with his student friend Bob Waterman. As the men drive their jeep over a nearly impassable rock road, Waterman tells Abby that he is thinking about staying here for good to avoid the military draft. When they get to the edge of the canyon, they abseil down into the canyons below to look at the untouched rock forms and talk about how useful language is. 
At first, Abby thinks that language helps people understand and remember their surroundings. Waterman calls this a greedy urge, which Abby agrees with. When it starts to rain and they can't use the rock path to get out, Waterman gives up on getting refuge, and they leave quickly. When it's time to leave the desert, Abby both doesn't want to go back to New York and can't wait to see people again, even if it's just cab drivers and train operators. Even though he's spent most of his time alone, the desert has made him feel so good that, despite his violent hate, he's surprisingly nice when a loud Nazi comes to the park. On his last day, Abby is so sad that he goes right away and doesn't even stop to say goodbye to his favorite juniper tree. As Bob Ferris, a new ranger, drives him to the Denver airport, Abby has another crazy urge, to turn around right away. Ferris refuses, though, and presses on the gas into the sunset. Abby comes to terms with the fact that he has to go back to society. About the author. Edward Abbey's mother was an organist and taught him to love art. His father was a communist and taught him to be skeptical of the government. From a very young age, he was interested in writing and politics. Abbey was honorably discharged from his job as a clerk in the military, which he turned down. He then studied how violence is used in political rebellion and openly supported anarchy in his written essays. The FBI started a file on him because of these interests. I'd be insulted if they weren't watching me, Abby said later. At age 29, he got a summer job as a park ranger at Arches National Monument near Moab, Utah. This was because of his early love of nature, which he developed by traveling through the American West. Here, he wrote down notes that would become Desert Solitaire, 1968, a highly charged memoir. Even though several of Abby's books were turned into films, this memoir, which came out at the same time as the environmental movement of the 1960s, was his first big bestseller. In his 1975 book The Monkey Wrench Gang, he continued the harsh political language of that book. This book later inspired the real-life eco-terrorist group Earth First. Abby kept writing environmentalist books, memoirs, and political essays until he was 62 years old and died. Abby is seen as a key person in the environmentalist movement of the 1960s and 1970s because of these two important works and his angry public presence. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.